Hello and welcome to this Institute of Economic Affairs vidcast with me, Sai Kamal. I'm the Academic and Research Director at the IEA. Now, the IEA is producing new content almost daily, podcasts, videos and webinars online throughout the lockdown to help you understand the impact coronavirus is having on the global economy, but also to cover other economic issues. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, IEA London. Check out our IEA Daily Bulletin or our website, www.iea.org.uk to ensure that you never miss an episode. Now, over the last three decades, governments, when looking at environmental policy, have set targets. Now, to some, these lack urgency, to others, they're unachievable. Others may well say they're undesirable and not necessarily needed. Will 2050 be another target that passes us by? If indeed we do need to decarbonise, what are the market mechanisms to achieve it? Now, these are just some of the issues that we are aiming to address in our Zero In In series. Now, firstly, in the first podcast, we interviewed Kingsmill Bond from Carbon Tracker, who was optimistic that the market had already provided us with the foundations we need to achieve net zero carbon emissions by the 2050 target. Our second guest, Professor Richard Toll from Sussex University, was more sceptical, but supportive of a carbon tax as a possible policy solution to achieve in a nudging industry to perhaps meet a target maybe 50 years later. Our third guest, Dr. Jamie White, a classical liberal academic and author of Crimes Against Logic, says net zero will be very difficult to achieve and will require incredible political will. He challenges the notion that global warming warrants any sort of these sorts of taxes on the emission of greenhouse gases. Now, today, I'm delighted to be joined by Bruno Pryor, who's an IEA trustee and director of Summerlees, who have been investing in renewables for over 40 years for the fourth of our IEA's Zero In series. Bruno, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're really looking forward to talking to you about some of your experience. Thanks for having me. Could you perhaps start by explaining, in your terms, uh, although how you see it, the UK's current energy policy, especially with regard to renewables and how we got here? Ooh, how did we get here? Well, so I, I think you have to go back to 1990 for obvious reasons. Um, that was when uh, privatisation of the uh, energy and in electricity industry started. And in that privatisation process, they realised that uh, nuclear wasn't uh, too cheap to meter. It was actually too expensive to sell. And they had to find some way of making it look floatable. Um, and so they introduced a subsidy for it called the non-fossil fuel obligation. And the accident of that naming made it impossible for them to resist people who were in renewables already, like uh, our company was, uh, the argument that, well, we're non-fossil as well, so how can you give that to nuclear and not to uh, renewables? And so the first renewable subsidy started um, with privatisation, near enough. Funny thing was, before privatisation, almost all the renewable people were very free market because we'd been making electricity or anything else and hadn't had anyone to sell it to. And we'd all mainly campaigned for opening up the market. Once you got a subsidy, of course, everyone started piling in for the subsidy. It changed the nature of the market almost immediately. But that's that was the origin of it. And it was immediately a winner picking mechanism. They said, we want X megawatts of this technology, Y megawatts of that technology, which was largely about trying to manage the cost. Um, and really, all the policy carried on from there. Every new mechanism has followed the same line. And, and, and so we have a fair amount of the things that they wanted, they chose to pick. Um, we have a very unbalanced renewable sector where 80% of energy demand, which is uh, heat and transport, has been largely untouched. 20%, which is electricity, has been very heavily targeted and within that by certain technologies. So we have, um, I would say, very poor re uh, energy, not just renewable policy, energy policy in general, uh, in, in the same league as Germany and Spain, as the three worst energy policy countries um, in Europe, if not the world. Well, it's interesting you say that because some environmentalists have claimed that, you know, renewable energy is now or soon will be cheaper than fossil fuels. Is this true? And could the UK get close to 100% of its energy needs from renewable sources? And what are the obstacles? Well, the first thing we have to be really clear about is, I think, there, when you say environmentally, say renewable energy will be cheaper, what you're really talking about is renewable electricity. And that's a very common error that most people make. And they assume we're doing very well on renewable energy, which we're not because we're not addressing most of it. We're only doing the electricity. So the question really is, is renewable electricity very cheap? Because they're talking mainly about wind and solar. 
one piece of evidence there, um, or pair of evidence, really, if you look at the wholesale price for electricity, so the price that a generator gets paid, it has been going down recently. And advocates of renewable energy point to that and say it is reducing our costs. But probably people have noticed that their bills haven't gone down to the same degree. In fact, the price of the electricity on your domestic bill has been going up. So how do we explain that your uh, cost of electricity when you buy it is going up quite a lot, but the cost of electricity when it's paid to the generator is going down? And the simple explanation is that we have a very complicated set of mechanisms that insulate the generators from a lot of their costs. And those costs are passed back to consumers, um, but, but don't hit the wholesale price. If that weren't the case, I don't think anyone would be saying that the uh, cost of renewable electricity uh, is anywhere near as cheap as, as it appears to be. Just to be clear, could you, uh, for, the, for the viewers and listeners, uh, distinguish between uh, renewable electricity and renewable energy, just so they're clear? Yeah, it's some very use, simple rules of thumb. So if you take all of the energy that we use, there are three main uses, electricity for lighting and equipment, appliances, um, heat and transport. And roughly in the UK, about 20% of what we use is electricity, 40% is heat and 40% is transport. If you look at the carbon intensity, electricity was always historically much more carbon intense because it's a, a low efficiency conversion of the fossil fuels. You lose a lot of the energy producing electricity. And so it was more like a third, a third, a third of the carbon. But in terms of use, it's 20 electricity, 40 heat, 40 transport. So if the government focuses on electricity, it's not addressing 80 percent of the energy we use and the, and, and the carbon. And so I think I saw something like 75 percent of all the carbon reductions we've achieved so far have been in that 20 percent of our energy use that is electricity. And why do you think we're not doing so well if that uh, I know that's quite a sort of uh, judgmental uh, statement, but why do you think we're not doing so well? on renewable energy uh, more, more widely? Because we had winner picking policy, because we had policy that targeted certain technologies, they were almost exclusively for decades about electricity. The first renewable heat policy um, was introduced under 10 years ago, whereas the first renewable electricity policy was introduced in 1990. So that gives you a, an idea of the discrepancy. And, and the argument was that electricity was a low hanging fruit because if you can take coal-fired generation out, uh, it does save you a lot of carbon quite quickly. There's, there's some validity to that. But you also need to get on with, if you want to actually achieve anything, you do have to get on with the other stuff. And if you leave it for 20 years doing nothing, you've still got to start from standing start 20 years later. You actually should be starting on all of it at the same time. That is one of the arguments for simple carbon pricing, carbon tax, my preference for carbon pricing, because it doesn't make any any uh, difference between electricity heat transport it, you you do whatever you can that makes the most cost sense uh, whether it's in one sector or the other and it probably would have been a lot in electricity as well but we also would have made a much more significant start on heat and transport if you look at sweden which is a carbon tax started a carbon tax a very long time ago they are now oh i think around about 60 percent renewable energy not just renewable electricity in their in their industry and that isn't just because they've got a lot of hydro they've actually developed a lot of other technologies biomass and, and without the winner picking it it does all sorts of very interesting things and one of the debates about renewables clearly is uh, and, and low carbon is the the role of nuclear mm -hmm. how, how do you see nuclear playing a role in the future i'm always this is this is ironic because i suppose a big part of the point of this is for us to have a talk about technologies because it's my background. But I'm always loath to prognosticate on, on technologies because everyone seems tempted to advocate whichever they think is the good or the bad technology. Uh, we don't advocate that chinos are better than genes, right? We just let people choose what they want. Um, and it should be the same thing. If, if, if uh, nuclear seems the most economic solution for certain types of electricity demand, then great, we should do the electricity, assuming, you know, the other social implications, people are happy to have them, the power stations nearby and so on, and we can deal with the waste. There's nothing wrong or right about nuclear. Fairly obviously, nuclear is a an electricity technology. So again, when people talk about nuclear, they're making that mistake of forgetting that it's not going to 
uh, primarily or directly address the other 80 percent of energy. And it's not going to address a lot of the electricity because it really, for economics, needs to run, might as well run baseload, which is effectively flat for the bit of electricity demand that is there all the time because you get almost no uh, saving in the operation cost from derating de a nuclear power plant, from, from running it below its capacity. Um, you've got all the costs, but you get half the income. So nuclear really wants to run flat and wants to be married to the sort of demand that also runs flat. Now, there could well be quite a good alliance between electric transport and nuclear. Because one of the things that electric transport can do is charge up at night. And by charging up at night, we can flatten the curve. This is a popular phrase at the moment, but different. Flatten the curve. So the demand for electricity is very wavy between day and night and to a lesser extent um, across the week and across the year. Um, but if you can use electricity in the, in the low periods of that wave, then you can flatten that curve. And that allows you to run more baseload. And if you can run more baseload, it may allow you to run more uh, electric, uh, more nuclear because that's what suits nuclear. But you know, no one should be planning that. Boris shouldn't be planning that. No one should be planning that on the basis that anyone is saying, oh, that's the right mix. They should be allowing the market to send the price signals and then allowing people like EDF to choose whether to build those power stations or not. Now, you've been involved in renewables for over 40 years. And so we're looking back, the dash for renewables began around the early 2000s. If you could go back those two decades and change energy policy then, what would you do differently? I have a carbon tax. Very simple. I, I, I entirely agreed with uh, Jamie and Richard in the earlier, earlier podcasts. Um, it, it has skewed our energy markets so badly, the, the, the mass of different policies. Um, and it's not only the skewing effect, it's actually very much... It's a very large deterrent to entrepreneurs because you've got an enormous amount of what they call regime uncertainty. In other words, when you're deciding whether to make an investment, you as a businessman think you've probably got a reasonable idea of what the market in its own right will do. You probably shouldn't be in business if you don't have a feel for that. You have almost no idea of what a politician might do in response to articles in the Daily Mail. But you've got to try and decide whether you're going to invest that money in that in installation and hope that the policy doesn't change if the policy is a very large factor in your income. So it's, it's actually a deterrent to doing anything as well as a means of delivering a lot of some things and not much of others, regardless of whether they make sense on cost. Now, um, I told you, what's your view on the EU's emission trading scheme? You know, I mean, we're clearly leaving after Brexit. But should we stay part of it like Norway and Iceland or should we replace it with, say, a British ETS? Ditch it all together. What's your personal view? So the EU ETS, I think, is is a very straightforward answer. We're, sadly, we go back that far that we were there before the EU ETS when they were designing it, when they were talking about how to do it. Um, and when they were having those conversations, my father went to Brussels and listened to them saying about how they were going to set up the rules. And at the end of it, he said, but they'll cheat. And what he meant was EU ETS depends on each nation deciding roughly what it can achieve. It sets its own targets. And there's a massive prisoner's dilemma times 27, um, a free rider problem. Uh, if you're a smart government and you set your target relatively loose, now you've got excess that you sell to the governments that were gullible and set their targets tight. But of course, if you know that will happen, every government should do the same thing, which is a very simple explanation for why the EU ETS fell to almost nothing in value. It's, it's not a an accident it's built into uh, the the game theory related to that um, so EU ETS as something that relies on all governments to inflict equal pain on each other is is a farce um, and should be put out of its misery um, it's an interesting question I haven't actually considered you wouldn't have the same problem if it was just a national emissions trading scheme but there was a, there, there were so many problems with the EU ETS and another one I think that you would get in a national emissions trading scheme as well is you want something that makes no distinction between all the different uses and technologies and one problem with emissions trading was the transaction costs of applying it to small uses so it was deliberately designed to only affect the large uses because what you're seriously going to put a cap on each domestic user's consumption of energy so um, it left large chunks. There was, it never affected heat. 
for instance. Yes. It was it only primarily affected electricity and industry. Another problem, of course, is when you primarily affect electricity and industry, you very radically affect your nation's ability to uh, manufacture compared to nations that aren't inflicting that cost. And it's very easy to offshore industry. And that, of course, is what's happened. A large part of our reduction in uh, carbon emissions was uh, intensive energy moving abroad. The bit of your economy you do not want to inflict the most pain on is your intensive energy. The bit that isn't going to move abroad are things like your domestic energy consumption. But that's the one we decided for obviously public choice reasons, because the people who use domestic energy are the voters. Um, that's the bit that politicians have always shied away from uh, inflicting. They got caught accidentally on electricity because the pass through of the costs on the generators hit consumers. But on heat, on gas, there's been very, very little. And I think if you did a, a UK emissions trading scheme, that would still stay the same. So you would you would be doing more of what you're already doing and, and not at, attacking the bits that you probably need to attack. Now you spoke earlier of a carbon tax and were we to move more in that direction? There are certain parts of, that, of taxation that that um, is claimed by the government that it's a part of a carbon tax. Um, how do you introduce that? Do you make it, uh, you know, and how do we make sure it's sort of tax neutral or it doesn't uh, uh, you know, it bear an uh, disproportionate cost on the very poorest in society, for example, their energy bills, their transport bills? Absolutely. And, and Richard, of course, talked about that. It is no question. A straight carbon tax without measures is regressive. And Kingsmill talked to, uh, about the carbon dividend. I think, Richard, in fact, we may all have talked, and I will certainly talk about carbon dividend. It's possibly the most widely endorsed uh, proposal by economists of anything ever. There's over three and a half thousand economists have backed this idea of a carbon dividend, including 27 Nobel laureates. Um, and the idea is you impose your carbon tax, you now have a pot of money, and you recycle that back to households. Um, and if you recycle that roughly um, to each household equally, you, you turn a regressive measure into progressive measure. Because although it is true that the poorest households use the most energy as a proportion of their income, which is why it's regressive, it's also true that the poorest households use in absolute terms less energy. So if you, if you tax that energy, you raise less money from the poor household, but you return it equally, they're getting some of the rich man's tax. So you turn a, a regressive measure into a progressive measure. That sort of ties into what Jamie said about one of the things you can't look at uh, carbon tax is a revenue raising mechanism. It was my only quibble. It is a revenue raising mechanism because uh, you aren't necessarily having a carbon tax to stop people using carbon. You're having a carbon tax to price that carbon. And it may well be that everyone looks at that price and says, I still want to emit that carbon. So you may still well have a lot of revenue. But if you're using measures, well, welfare measures to make it a progressive um, uh, tax, then you can't use it also to reduce other taxes. It's only going to be used to reduce the effect of its own impact. So both you and I have referred to the other video vidcast in this series, the previous episodes with Kings Milbourne, Professor Toll and Dr. White. I know you've watched them all. Mm. I just wondered um, what your particular perspectives on each of them were in a way where you agreed, disagreed, um, you know, you can be as diplomatic or as undiplomatic as you wish. I, I agreed with that, except for that little quibble about Jamie and, and carbon tax and revenues. I agreed absolutely with Jamie and, and I wouldn't be so bold as to disagree with Richard because he's a very eminent uh, uh, economist in this field. Uh, they both excellent. As far as Kingsmill goes, of course, I uh, we're all tempted as businessmen to take a very constructive attitude to we should do X, Y and Z. It's one reason why, on the whole, governments should not listen to businessmen. Um, we, uh, Russ Roberts in his podcast likes to talk about you should be pro market, not pro business. Um, of course, we all want everyone to favour our our solutions, but governments shouldn't do that. Uh, they should create an institutional framework within which all businessmen like me and Kingsmill can try and do our best to uh, deliver the outcomes as efficiently as we can. So I I understand why Kingsmill takes the view of offering solutions. In a sense, it's just answering the questions that are asked, but it isn't. I always have to remind myself not to do the same thing. I have to say, Bruno, it's very reassuring to hear a businessman or business person talk about uh, you know, a particular solution, but not be a rent seeker at the same yeah. time. <laughs>
So it's a, it's, a, it's a very rare thing, a very rare thing indeed. One of the important points you've made, uh, particularly at the beginning of this podcast, was that we should distinguish between renewable energy and re renewable electricity. And a lot of the debate has been around renewable electricity. So there are a couple of other components of renewable energy I'd like to talk about. The first of all, well, first one is transport. I'd like to ask your view about policy around that and how we can get more renewable uh, you know, um, transport. And secondly, renewable heating. And I know that's your area of speciality. So let's start with transport first. Absolutely. I, and caveat with I'm, I'm not an expert on transport. I've done uh, a lot of heat recently. I did electricity a lot in the past, but I've never done much transport. But I do have a uh, pluggable hybrid um, just uh, to, to learn from. Um, if we think of the most recent uh, renewable transport policy, it was suggestion they're going to ban um, uh, diesel and, and petrol cars from and possibly even hybrids uh, from was it 2030? Yeah, combustible engines that's right yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's a classic example of where a crude policy mechanism rather than pricing uh, has unintended consequences so the obvious effect of that the intended effect is to get people to drive a lot of electric cars and we could add quite a lot of electric cars onto our network using those dips I talked about earlier in demand at night, charging up at night, but not all of it. And so then the question is, what happens if you move more than that amount onto electric? And you, you will exceed the capacity of our grid, which means massive investment to do that. Then you have to ask yourself, will the electricity be there? Because there's no point running electric cars and charging them up with gas-fired electricity. Really. So you might you want to ask what's going to go into it. And you've got a very big challenge to align uh, your demand beyond a certain point with the production of low carbon electricity. These are very complicated things to do. And one of the reasons us free marketeers, a primary reason we believe in the market is as a means of condensing information into a simple signal. A ban ignores all of that and just says we assume we know the right answer and it's going to be right for everyone. If we could rely on pricing to steer people's choices, those for whom it makes sense to move to electric can move to electric, but that won't necessarily be true for everyone. And one of the things just it strikes me, but again, no one should do this because I'm advocating it. This is me picking a winner. It strikes me for a long time hybrids are going to be more sensible than full electric because are we seriously going to carry around tons of batteries? that we don't really need for most of our journeys, because most journeys are quite short. They're sort of 20, 30 miles in a day. If you had a hybrid, you'd still run on electricity for most of those journeys. But if you want to drive to Scotland, you can do it. And you haven't had to load up your car with batteries that you're lugging around for no good reason for a long time. And you haven't got to worry about how you, you beef up your infrastructure to cope with only having electric cars. Um, I don't know if that's right. And if I'm wrong, I'm always perfectly happy for the market to show me I'm wrong. Um, but I, I wish they weren't doing it by means of a ban. I wish they were doing it by means of pricing the externality. Um, just to be clear, um, the ban, I know you said 2030 at the beginning, it was uh, originally 2040, the ban on the sale of combustion, combustion engine cars. The government has brought it back, back brought it forward to 2035. Um, but there is talk, effectively, that is early, uh, 2030, because people make purchasing decisions way before that. And, and it's an expert on, uh, on drugs. Right? Exactly. Um, and the other thing in that mix as well is that a lot of people, there are a couple of things. One is that people talk about battery electric, but they can't, um, But when, they, when you talk to some of the major car manufacturers, they think there will be two types of engine. One will be battery electric. The other one will be, uh, some call it hydrogen fuel cell. In the US, <laughs> they call it hydrogen electric. And there's some infrastructure trying to be developed around that, particularly around companies that have fleets, for example. Mm. So, for example, if you've got a fleet of buses or, say, your Heathrow Airport and for all your internal, tra or internal transport, you could probably uh, you know, have hydrogen. Have, have you done any thinking on that? I'm a hydrogen skeptic. <laughs> Again, we've been around that long. We've done hydrogen before, almost with renewable hydrogen before anyone else did. So we, we had a, uh, a site in Cambridgeshire where uh, we had lots of potential to produce renewable electricity, but couldn't get an electrical connection. And so we decided that we would experiment on trying to produce hydrogen because it was another way of getting the energy out. Um, that was eventually cut up into bits and sold to Saudi Arabia. Right. Uh, 
it it just wasn't viable now of course all sorts of people will be innovating innovations may well change that but all the things we learned from that made me very skeptical about that as a technology i mean perhaps an endorsement of that i don't know if you saw in the last few days was it bmw and mercedes announced they're terminating their hydrogen fuel cell program uh they're giving up on on that they just assume that that policy is driving people towards electric so why fight it um I, I, of course, there will be applications. Perhaps buses will be a good application for that. The, the question you've got to ask with hydrogen, one of many questions, is where is the hydrogen coming from? Everyone likes to mix up two ideas about hydrogen. They assume that what it'll do is use all our excess uh, wind and solar when we've got too much of it. Um, but that's very expensive. Electrolysis, which is what we did, is a very expensive way of producing unnecessarily pure hydrogen. The cheap way of producing hydrogen is cracking hydrocarbons um typically gas um so if you were going to do that you've then got to do carbon capture and storage on the gas um and you are into massive infrastructure um i'm if you don't do that of course there's no carbon benefit to it so i, I you tend to find people assuming that it'll be electrolysis but assuming the cost of of steam reformation of, of hydrocarbons um i i'm i'm very skeptical about hydrogen it, it's People like to talk about it's it's got um, one of the highest calorific values known hydrogen. It's also got one of the lowest energy densities. So calorific value is per uh, kilogram, but energy density is per cubic meter. You've got to find a way to cram all of that in. It was very high pressure into a tank. And one of the problems we had uh, with our uh, project in Cambridge um, was dealing with storage because you demand isn't necessarily the same as your production. Uh, one of many things you want to produce flat, you want to produce continuously because you're um, uh, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the word for it. Uh, it corrodes anyway, the uh, uh, the electrolysis plant, if it sits around, so you want to run it continuously. But your demand isn't, so you've got to store it. You've got to store the oxygen as well. And oxygen is actually harder to deal with than, than hydrogen. And it's very hard to find a market for. <laughs> there are many, many practical problems, but people may well come up with all sorts of innovative solutions. And as I said before, if the market goes a certain way, I'm very happy with it. If it goes a certain way because governments decided it should be that way and made it go that way, I'm very unhappy. Yeah, I, I find hydrogen fascinating because uh, when you think about talking to the industry and you think about the distinction between blue, so-called blue hydrogen and green hydrogen, and blue hydrogen being the sort of byproduct of industrial processes, green hydrogen, probably being uh, some of the ideas they've got, for example, in the Middle East, having large solar farms that they, you, then, uh, you, that you then use for electrolysis, that then, and then you've got the existing pipelines that you can then convert to hydrogen pipelines to transport those over long distances. But as you say, it's not going to be a sort of universal, universally applicable, as it were. Let's, let's sorry. No, I was going to say, one of the interesting things, I think, for free marketeers, a real threat from hydrogen, that it's being talked up a lot as well as a heating fuel for the longer term. Um, it will require the most enormous infrastructure, assuming it will be mainly steam reformation, which actually, if you look at most of the models, they assume it will be steam reformation. You're going to have to do it where you can do it at very large scale and then store all the hydrogen you need for winter in a massive un underground cabin, presumably, and have another massive underground cabin to store all the carbon that you took off the gas that you cracked. That is going to be done at such large scale to be viable. I imagine that competition will be non-existent that there will be a regional producer uh a regional supplier and it'll go back to almost pre-privatization of the uh, as we had the electricity boards we'll probably have hydrogen boards if it did that and then how will we ensure value when that is what happens so i i, I there's, a, there's a big debate in free market circles that, about uh, antitrust and the extent to which government should in, ensure competition. I'm quite a hawk on that. I do think government should ensure competition. Strikes me, government's trying to push us towards hydrogen are doing exactly the opposite. Well, thank you for that. And, and about now, that's about an area where you've said a lot, given that you uh, claim not to know very much about it, Bruno. So now I'm looking forward to the next part, which is asking you about the, the heat, heat part of the renewable uh, equation. Yes. Uh, so that's what I've been doing uh, for the previous 10 years was running a business that supplied renewable heating fuel, uh, which we sold relatively uh, recently um, from absolute despair that that part of the market would ever turn into something uh, ha worth having invested in, uh, which gives you a, a sense of where we're at. And, and interestingly, the government two days ago just brought out its new proposals 
for how to try and stimulate that more because they did nothing until 2011. The measures they introduced in 2011 were uh, it was called the renewable heat incentive were uh, very ineffective. They delivered very little. They primarily delivered the technology that we invested in, which is biomass heat. Um, but then the government didn't like that because they didn't want that technology. And so they tried very hard to make it deliver other technologies that actually the market didn't want and stopped it delivering the technology the market did want, which was biomass heat. So you end up uh, with nothing. The government have now doubled down and are making it very winner picking in these new proposals. They're relying primarily on a thing called green gas, uh, which funny enough is another area that we invest in, um, anaerobic digestion. Um, where you basically you take all the nasty things you don't want to think about when uh, food is produced, uh, you collect them and you put them in a big tank and gas comes off. Um, and, and you can either use that to produce electricity uh, by putting it into a, gen a generator or you can purify it. You can take the carbon dioxide out of it and you're left with mostly methane, which is natural gas. And you can inject that into the grid and it can be used for anything, a heating fuel or a generation fuel. Or you could also um, use that purified gas to run vehicles on. So it really can do everything. One problem with that is everything is an awful lot of energy and there isn't an awful lot of that food waste. So we were one of the earliest investors in uh, anaerobic digestion. Uh, we actually bought one of the first plants that had gone bust twice because of government rules. Um, we broke the things that the government forced on it so it became viable. Um, we, we have a, um, an anaerobic digestion plant in uh, Devon, which was one of the first in the country. Um, and the economics of that plant, when we started, depended very much on two uh, income streams. One was what people paid you to take that food waste. And the other was the energy that you produced. Um, the government then stimulated this market very heavily because uh, they like to believe this will be a major contributor. And one, one very predictable effect of stimulating demand for food waste is that demand exceeds supply and uh, what you can charge to take that food waste goes down and down to the point that we get very little income from uh, people paying us to take their food waste away, which tells you that the market is all but saturated. There is very little more food waste. That is very inconvenient to most policymakers because they really don't know what to do about heat. And this sounds like a really easy option because if you can take biogas and put it in the grid, no one has to change what they do. Most of the country heats with gas and they just carry on. But there's no way that there's enough resource to do anywhere near as much gas as we take in um, through our pipelines and our uh, LNG ships. It's, it's a tiny fraction. We're supposed to be, um, at, at, according to Goldman Sachs, a study they did in 2009, they reckon we could do up to half of our uh, domestic gas consumption with this technology by now, by 2020. So it's a very good time to look back and ask it, ask what we are, and we're under 1%. Um, and, and that is simply because it's actually a very difficult, expensive and risky thing to do. And uh, primarily, the resource is very limited. There are other resources. The Germans have done a huge amount with um, energy crops, but, but that's become very unpopular there because that's displacing farm production. Um, and you have almost a monoculture of production of, of uh, silage, maize silage for anaerobic digestion. Um, and still only a very modest contribution to their energy requirements. So the question is, where will this all come from? And I think heat is the biggest challenge for policymakers, but there's a, there's a tendency of policymakers to latch onto the thing that they want to believe will be the most popular thing, the easiest thing, and then pay people to produce reports that show that it can be. And those people will produce those reports if that's what they're paid to do. Realistically, it is not going to be a lot of biogas. It can be a bit of biogas, but it's only going to be a little bit. So what else is it going to be? Well, the government have only, uh, in this proposal, have only targeted two technologies. The other one is um, a modest proposal uh, to encourage heat pumps, which is where you use electricity to extract the energy out of the air or out of the ground um, and upgrade that heat to a temperature that's useful um, in your houses. Um, there are so many challenges to that. That is a very popular uh, model again, because we've all got an electrical connection. Um, but that was encouraged 
in the mechanism that's been around for the last uh, nine years, and very little happened. Um, there was a modest amount of the uh, technology that takes the energy out of the air, called air source heat pumps, in domestic circumstances, but tiny relative to our uh, electricity demand. If we did a lot, it would have very, very significant system impacts because heat is different to electricity and transport. In the electricity and transport, vary a certain amount over the year, but not that much. They're, they're manageable. You can, you can have uh, equipment that's designed to run most of the year and have a good economic uh, model. Heat, you need most of it in the four coldest months of the year. And uh, you therefore, if you're going to do it with electricity, you're going to have to have all the wires beefed up to run all that electricity to every house, way beyond the capacity it currently needs. Um, to supply that heat for the four months a year. And then you've got to figure out where the electricity will come from over those wires. Um, it's not to be solar because <laughs> there's no solar electricity near enough in the, in winter. Um, and wind is highly erratic. It is a bit stronger in winter than than summer, but it's uh, it's nowhere near as, as uh, seasonal as the demand. So you've got to figure out how you're going to store that uh, to do uh, do your winter heating. It's it's a It's a real challenge. It's a challenge, again, where it's so complex that the only sensible thing to do would be to leave it to the market and let's discover the solutions. And it's probably going to be a whole mix. Um, but the government has has refined policy in this proposal where it did at least encourage a few different technologies previously. Now looking at two, um, both of which have very significant problems. So our, our plans for decarbonizing heat are a mess as far as I can see. Well, that's not very reassuring, but it's good that someone's actually analysed that and, you know, and highlighted that fact, given the focus is mostly, as you say, on renewable electricity rather than heat or transport. Let's just, by rounding up, um, this, you know, if you think about the premise of this series, it's all about the government targets to achieve net zero carbon by 2050. And we've been asking how you achieve that. Is it possible? Um, but one of the questions we don't ask and people are too scared to ask is, is it desirable? Um, and I know you have some views on that. Very, very strong views. Um, most in the industry, as you said, a lot of rent seekers now in renewables because it's largely dictated by uh, government support. Uh, most will say yes, because uh, yes is the way to get the government to pour more money in. Um, because I go back to the days of um, free market re renewables developers. My view is very different. It, it, if you take a, just the basic economics that Jamie explained, there's a, there's a cost beyond which it does not make sense to decarbonize. That let's let's accept that uh, there will be costs in the future from carbon going into the atmosphere. Uh, it, it, you the the price of carbon is set ideally by what we think the current value is of that harm in the future. To pay more now to reduce carbon than the expected cost of that harm in the future it makes no sense. We're making ourselves poorer now for not enough benefit for our descendants in the future. So you should you should only do as much renewables or any other decarbonisation technology as is justified by the future cost that you're avoiding. Very interesting. Jamie talked about costs here. If I talk a little about what I know then on the practicalities of that. Um, so if uh, the recent estimates were sort of 40 to 80 dollars per tonne of carbon, Jamie generously allowed it could be as much as 200. Let's let's take 100 dollars per tonne of carbon as a perhaps more than any than the uh, Treasury currently thinks we should pay, but not way outside their range. 100 tonne, 100 dollars per tonne of carbon or 100 pounds per tonne of carbon um, would be about two pence per kilowatt hour of gas. If I've got that right, it's 0.2 uh, tons of carbon per kilo, per megawatt hour. So yeah, I think two pence per uh, kilowatt hour. Um, if your gas price went up by two pence, it would hurt a lot. That would add what a, a half again to your cost of heating. I'm pretty sure most people won't stop heating their house though. I'm pretty sure most people will look at how they can avoid wasting their heat, and hopefully we'd see a lot of efficiency, which is the unsung uh, elements of decarbonisation. Um, but would two pence pay to make most people switch to uh, zero carbon heating technologies? 
very little actually there'd be some and it would encourage people like me to innovate to try and do more and more and get do it within a cost the same with transport the same with electricity actually at the sorts of prices people currently estimate for the cost of carbon there would be very little renewable electricity or renewable energy so then the question is have they got the price of carbon wrong because it is disastrous in the future so if you set your price of carbon at a level that delivers nothing well why have you set it at that price or have they got the price right and actually mainly what we should do is adapt and i would say that that would be the sort of thing that richard toll would be an expert in i'm not an expert in that but but what you can't have i don't think is the wishful thinking of thinking um that if we set carbon at the sort of price most people believe carbon should be at at the moment we would get a huge amount of renewables or other low carbon solutions so then why are we getting all these things why are we getting a lot of renewable electricity for a lot higher cost than the uh, cost of carbon um when what it's avoiding is far less cost than what it's costing us if that makes sense and then, uh, I, I kind of get it. Yes. Um, interesting enough, you touched there on the sort of unsung hero, as it were, which mm. was sort of energy efficiency, energy conservation. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Yes. Um, so I always compare Sweden with the UK. Um, we all pick our cases. I, I love Sweden for many reasons, and their energy policy is one of them. They've shown how it could be done right with a three decades old carbon tax. Only more recently did they start picking winners. They they actually looked at Germany and UK and thought that was the right way to do it. We should all have done the opposite and looked at Sweden. Um, so the Swedes have encouraged uh, a lot of things with a carbon tax. And one of the things they encourage is very high energy efficiency. So if you look at their houses and you allow for the fact it's a lot colder in Sweden than it is in the UK, their houses are roughly twice as efficient as our houses. So they use a bit more energy per year than we do per house, but it's obviously a lot colder. Um, and why have they done that? Well, it's very expensive energy. So expensive energy, you will try and save it. Um, they didn't particularly target anything other than that. We have tried to target efficiency measures with with things like the energy efficiency commitments and its successors, which paid our energy suppliers to install energy efficiency measures in their customers' houses, particularly in uh, in social housing. Um, that has been quite positive, but obviously your incentives are very different. If you're a Swede and you're paying to have insulation in your house, you want it done perfectly because you've got to save all that money because of the carbon tax. Here you're an energy supplier and you're paying to put insulation in you don't care how well it's done because your your job is done by doing it not by how well it's done and your customer gets no choice in it because they're not controlling that so it's the, the general rule with efficiency is it has to be stimulated by demand pull not supply push and we've effectively been pushing on that piece of string so there have been efficiency improvements and that's i'm sure that there's an element of those support mechanisms in there there's also an element of our energy got a lot more expensive, um, particularly our electricity, but to some extent our heating fuels. At, and uh, people would have tried to save it, but still our, our efficiency is very, very poor. One of the things um, that's been talked about recently, it was in the manifestos um, for the general election, was uh, imagine that we're gonna deal with this with more retrofit, with, with improving the insulation on, on buildings. Um, the problem with that is we've done most of it. So uh, 90, I think more than 95% of the houses that have lofts that could be insulated already have insulation. There's only 2% that have lofts and have no insulation. Um, so how are we going to Im improve the efficiency with retrofit on there? It'll be margin improvements to actually make it deeper insulation, but then your margin improvements are relatively high cost for relatively small improvements. If you look at the government's own statistics, it's single figures percentages savings from installing these efficiency improvements so you don't make a radical difference because you've fundamentally got difficult um infrastructure you, you can't change your building um if you really want to change the energy consumption you actually need to change your infrastructure you'd have to rebuild but of course that's that's a a huge task but it, it might be a rather nice task to join in with what i think we all recognize as 
free market is that we need a lot more house building anyway. We've got all sorts of problems with, with housing in this country. If only we could decide that we need to tear down all the bad houses over the next 20 years, put up bigger houses, more stories, and in the process build more efficient houses, that could be a, a nice win-win. But that's me picking winners again. Bruno, this has been a fascinating uh, discussion. Um, I've covered a range of issues. Um, if I was to ask you just uh, to sort of round up, if you were to, if the government came to you and said, Bruno, what should we do, given your experience? What would you say in two or three sentences? I would say introduce a carbon tax, um, uh, offset the effects of that, because if you introduce a carbon tax, one of the winners are the people already getting the subsidies. So you have to then do the negative of that so they don't get a gain. Um, and that will be quite a, a saving. You must do the, the carbon dividend to make it progressive. Um, you should be clear about your long term um, intention on that. It'd be good to have rather like we a lot of us think on monetary policy, that there should be a rules based approach where we all know what's going to happen. Well, the same with this. Let's have a carbon tax and have a rule where we know what it's going to do each year or what the mechanism would be that allows it to be decided so that everyone can look at it and say, I know what my costs will be over the next 10 years of this. Perhaps it's going to get more expensive to use my energy in whatever way I use it. Um, and I will invest in this. Um, rather than, as I talked about earlier, the regime uncertainty of trying to guess what, what policy will come around the corner tomorrow. Um, yeah, if, if they could phase out, you, there's, a, there's an important concept in business where you're dealing with government called grandfathering. Uh, you do have to honour that as a government. Grandfathering is the idea that if a government introduces a mechanism and then decides a couple of years later it's going to scrap it, well, everyone who invested in it never listens to the government again. Yeah. So you actually have to honour what you would say you would do. And unfortunately, because we've done so many bad things, that will lock us into 10 or 20 years of ongoing cost of doing the wrong things. But insofar as they can, with all of the provisors, as I said, they need to switch off all of the uh, micromanaging targeted uh, winner picking mechanisms and introduce a carbon tax. And let's find out where we can get to in 2050. I'd be willing to bet it wouldn't be zero if we did that, but I don't know where it'd be, and it'd probably be about the right amount. Well, Bruno, thank you very much for your time today. It's been absolutely fascinating. Can I also thank all the viewers for tuning in? Uh, for analysis on uh, carbon zero, coronomics, and much more, please visit our website, www.ia.org.uk. Check out our YouTube channel, IA London, and subscribe to our IA Daily Bulletin. Look forward to seeing you again.